Well, as I said, uh, my name is Matt, Matt Tebow, although you wouldn't know it from the way it's spelt. Uh, we moved here 11 months ago from Montana through a relational connection with Pastor Scott. And since we've been here, it has been such a joy to get to know uh, the saints in this body and actually saints outside of this body as well. Just today, I was at a lunch with about 20 other pastors down in Visalia and uh, had a great time with pastors from all over the valley. So, hey guys, you guys are awesome, is all I'm trying to say. We love being here, and thanks for welcoming us. Uh, to start our time, I actually want us to stand up. So go ahead and stand up, and we're going to reseat. And the way I'd like to do this is I'd like, if you've got two college degrees, I want you to come sit over here. If you have one, sit right in the middle, and then if you don't have any college degrees, you can go over here. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that way. But stay up, stay up. Here's what we're going to do. If you're from, we're going to do it by ethnicity, okay? So if you're from Africa, you can come sit right here in the front, okay? If you're from Europe, we'll go right in the middle, right here. If you're from Asia, back there. If you're from South America, right over there. Okay, I'm just kidding. But I do want us to mix it up. So last thing, if you and your husband, or if you're single, just you, if you guys are worth 250000 or more, would you come right here in the front? Okay, sit down, sit down, sit down. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But, hey, if you feel played, by the way, it's because you were played. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Guys, listen. What's interesting about that is though we would never do something like that overtly, we all make judgments and, I'll say it this way, assessments every day. Are you with me? We all do this every day. We size people up. Don't tell me that when you walked in the room that you didn't observe some things. You noticed there were snacks and who was at the snacks and how many were left. You noticed who was talking to who, right? You noticed who brought their Bibles and a pen and who did not. And you made a conscious decision of where you would sit and where you would not sit. Now, I'm saying this because, again, we are all making assessments, not just of our context, but even of people all the time. To use another, maybe more indicting or convicting term, we all show components of favoritism. We all show aspects of partiality at times. And when I say we, myself included. We, as part of our depravity, judge people. Sometimes we make good judgments that are good and pure and right, and sometimes not so much. It's really what we do, right? We are constantly discerning, assessing, judging. Birds fly, fish swim, Cats go meow, and people judge. People judge. Now, I know I'm getting in your business a little bit here, but I'm doing this very much so intentionally because I want us to see that our text tonight is not just 2,000 years ago, a problem that was way back when and is irrelevant and has nothing to do with today. No, it's a 2,000-year-old problem that is very much so present, current, and relevant right here, right now. I would submit to you that we judge every day based on appearance, based on attraction, based on wealth and financial resources, based on cleanliness and personality, based on popularity and many, many other things. We do it, the entire world does it. So as we turn over to our book called James, when it came to the ministry function of this church, apparently this had become an issue for the church in Jerusalem. Who was the church going to put up front? Who were going to be the greeters? Who was going to be in the music ministry? Who got to host Bible study? And who got to lead Bible study? And oh, by the way, who were the leaders, the elders? Who were the deacons? Who were on this committee and that committee and that committee? It seems as though they had a problem with favoritism. Favoritism. And yet, there's just really one thing that's on my mind. One thing that I want us to contemplate tonight And that is, what about the gospel? What about the good news of Jesus Christ? Isn't this supposed to be a transforming reality? Why does our church, and not necessarily just ours, but the church in America, the church in the 21st century, look a lot like what James was addressing in the first century? Why are we not different? I thought the gospel was supposed to change us, not just save us. I thought it was supposed to humble us and teach us to be no respecter of persons, but to love indiscriminately and without partiality. If that's the case, then what about the gospel? Shouldn't the gospel impact the way that we view people and the way that we make assessments and discernments and judgments? 
You see, what Pastor James here in James chapter 2 is writing toward is he's writing to a group of shaken and dispersed Christians really about the transformational power of the gospel. They had forgotten, and I fear that at times so have we. So grab your Bibles and let's go over to James chapter 2. I want to look at verses 1 to 13 tonight. What I want us to do is really see something that will hopefully convict us and sanctify us. Now, just a little quick running start. You know James is the New Testament Proverbs. It's Christianity in blue jeans. And I just want to say this. Never let the lie slip into your mind as you're reading James. Right? Never let the lie slip in that James was not (laughs) gospel-centered. He very much so was gospel-centered. Let me remind you of who this man was. This was the half-brother of who? Of Jesus. And by the way, did he always believe? No, he had to be persuaded. The Holy Spirit at one time opened his eyes to believe that this man who he grew up with was in fact the divine son of God. So James had personally experienced the saving power of the gospel. And therefore, as he writes this, it's not contrary to the gospel of salvation by faith alone, through faith alone and Christ alone. No, no, no. It's actually an outflow of it. In fact, I would even say it this way. Martin Luther was wrong when he said, I don't know what to do with James. Maybe we should just throw it out. He struggled that much with this book. But again, I would submit to you, this book is an outflow of gospel transformation life. He'd seen it in his own life. And now he's commending these dispersed and discouraged Christians to live out the reality of what they've believed. So let's look at James chapter 2. Follow along as I read it once through, starting in verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in this good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He has promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture... You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, has also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is our passage for tonight. Now, in in route to arriving at the big idea of the passage, I want us to do a few background questions. And the first is, what was the contextual setting? What is going on here? And notice in verse 1, we get a clue when he says this phrase, when someone enters into the assembly. When someone enters into the assembly, that's in verse 2. This is in the context of what? Is it out there? Is it at work? Is it at home? No, it's actually in the church. It's in the church. So here's the scenario. A guy walks in the back doors of the church. He's got nice clothes on. He's freshly shaven. He's got his hair combed over, real clean looking. Clearly, he comes from a family of wealth. Clearly, he's in the business world and has power and persuasion. And so the greeters, oh, oh, sir, welcome. Welcome to our lovely abode. Let me bring you right this way. We have a special seat for you right here in the front. Cushy seats. Make yourself at home. Front row to the speaker. Everyone will see you. All eyes on you. Let us know if I can get you water or anything else. And then man number two enters in. Back door opens. The man walks in covered in soot, dirt on his face, grease all over his arms. Clearly, he's a worker with his hands. He's got beads of sweat on his forehead because he had to walk to church. He stinks. His hair is a mess. No appearance that you would look at him and say, oh, that's a leader. Oh, that is someone I want to care for and shepherd and put into ministry. And he walks in. The greeters go, oh, I hate man. Uh, Yeah, there's a spot. Yeah, 
could you, could you lay down right here on the ground just so this guy could put his feet on top of you if his legs get tired? I don't care if you're on your back or on your stomach. It doesn't really matter. Just, yeah, just lay down right there somewhere where we don't see you. Now, you're thinking, Matt, come on. We would never do that overtly. What James is hitting at is really a, a ridiculous example from the first century that would actually happen to, I think, convict us that we are likely guilty of some form of partiality. We are guilty of some level of making judgments based on what? Based on appearance, based on financial status, based on superficial things. He's addressing the problem being that the rich in particular were being given extra attention at the expense of those who were poor, and the text says shabby, (laughs) in shabby clothes. So before we stamp our hand with the big E that we're exempt from this, I want us to consider what might a few manifestations of this look like today. Well, put yourself in someone's shoes, in another woman's shoes. I'm not going to do that for obvious reasons, but you put yourself in another woman's shoes and think about if you were always the girl who wasn't as pretty as everyone else. You weren't as popular as the cool kids in school. You weren't as successful in your pursuits academically or in the business world. You don't have everything together as a mother like you see on Instagram with some other moms. You, you don't have the money to go spend on your hair and your makeup and doing fun things like you see other women doing. And now consider someone's life who their entire life they've been marginalized, they've been made fun of, they've been last picked on the team, so to speak, and they've always been passed over. Imagine what that, that's like for a moment. And then, at some point, this woman has the thought, oh, maybe the church will be different. Maybe the church will be a safe place. Maybe I can go there and they'll love me for who I am. They won't care if I'm overweight. They won't care if I don't have my makeup done perfect. They won't care if I don't have the most trendy clothes. What happens, though? What happens in the 21st century Church of America is that they realize this sudden treachery that the church is no different than the world. It's a shame. It's a shame. Partiality, playing favorites, clickiness. Ladies, as we as we prep to to launch into this, I just want to say the growth process is hard. Growing, right? Sanctification, which means to grow in the Lord, it's hard. Growth requires change, and change requires recognizing that I'm not right. I'm not where I should be in my Christian life. So it's my prayer that this passage would grip us and lead us toward change in further Christ-likeness. So looking at this text, verse 1, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory. And then he goes in to lay out this scenario. So the problem that's being laid out here, and we'll get into the details, is that, again, the rich were being promoted at the expense of the poor and shabby. Now, just a caveat on this. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to neglect the rich. He's not saying to swing the pendulum to the other side, right? In fact, in 1 Timothy 6, he instructs the rich to not necessarily give away everything they have, but to be rich in good deeds and to not put their hope in their riches. What, what the problem is in this church, though, in Jerusalem, and I think for us, is, is not paying attention to the wealthy, but it's neglecting the poor and the shabby. The fact that the focus here is actually on the poor is made evident throughout the book of James. Look at chapter 1. Notice what he said in verse 27. I think you saw this last week. He said, Religion that is pure and undefiled before the Father is this. Visit two people groups, orphans and widows both of whom are not going to catch the eye with their dazzling apparel. Chapter 2, verse 6, we're going to see that this issue is not with the rich, but with the poor. Likewise, in chapter 2, verse 8, and in 13, he says to show mercy. Well, mercy is only shown upon those who don't have means on their own. And then you're, next week, you're going to get into chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. Faith without works is dead. But notice in verse 15, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled without giving them the things they need. Well, what good is that? So I'm just pointing out that this is on James's mind, right? This issue of neglecting the poor, the physical needs, but also the spiritual needs. That's, I think, what he's driving at. Now, the last introductory question I want to ask is, what about the poor? What does James want us to do? And before we get ready to go start another Salvation Army or another Goodwill or another soup kitchen... I want to say, I don't think the point of this passage is to give. It's not necessarily to give to the poor. The point is more so not to neglect the spiritual health 
and to neglect the giftings of those who do not immediately catch your eye, whether it be because they're poor or they look different or they're not your same personality. As one of the pastors here, we're constantly looking to reproduce ourselves. We're looking to train up leaders. We're looking to train up teachers, small group leaders, evangelists, disciple makers. And what would you suppose would happen if we only narrowed in on the top 5% of whatever category you chose, right? Top 5% of best looking, top 5% of most wealthy, top 5% of most intellectual, most intelligent. Without a doubt, we would miss some of the best and most gifted saints in our church in that lower, lower 95%. Guys, I, I want you to consider that God has gifted with his spirit both those whom you like and you're naturally drawn to and those whom you're not drawn to. He's gifted the wealthy and the poor for ministry purposes. And so we arrive at our big idea. Here we go. Big idea for the night from this passage, I think, is this. Because God is an impartial God who decreed an impartial gospel, we are called to be transformed impartial Christians. Because God is an impartial God who has decreed an impartial gospel, we are called to be transformed impartial Christians. And I think this point is going to be driven home in two parts. First is gospel treason, and second is gospel transformation. So looking again at verse 1, we see the first command of the passage. There's three commands. The first in verse 1 is, my brothers, show no partiality. Now this word partiality simply means favoritism. It's favoritism. Often we think of it in terms of money or ethnicity, but really it's broader than that. It's actually showing favor, partiality is showing favoritism toward a group or perspective in an unjust manner. It's just any group or any perspective that is not justly derived. In that sense, favoritism certainly includes financial status, ethnic background, appearance, intellectual ability, and much, much more. Now, what's neat is behind this command, we've got a whole girth of Old Testament tradition, Old Testament theology that has built up a high view of our impartial God. I'll just read these for a moment. You can listen. Listen to a few passages. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Fascinating. Then on a passage on the greatness of God, one of the components of that greatness is, and oh, by the way, he's impartial in how he distributes grace and distributes that greatness. 2 Chronicles 19.7 Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do, for the Lord your God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bribe. Interesting, in this passage, it calls us to fear the Lord, and one of the reasons is is because God's not partial. (laughs) You're not automatically in His favorite corner just because you're from this family or that line or you go to church on Sunday. Proverbs 28, verse 21 To show partiality is not good, because for a piece of bread a man will transgress. So now we get into the applied wisdom of, hey, God's not partial. We should not be partial. This is sinful. Matthew chapter 22, God incarnate, the Son of God, Jesus, is being presented with the Pharisees with a trap. They were seeking to trap him. And in so doing, one of the things they profess is they said, hey, we know that you're not partial in any way. Even the Pharisees watching his ministry admitted, we know, Jesus, you're not partial in any way. Why? Because of the people you hang out with. Clearly, you're not partial. Acts chapter 10, verse 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now, (laughs) not previously, but now, that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Peter understood that it's not just for Jews, it's for Gentiles too. God's not partial to ethnic backgrounds, but the condition is faith. It is faith. From about age three on, I think kids and maybe even adults are usually curious as to why, right? You ask your kids, do the chores. Well, why? Because your mother and I love you, son. That's why you need to do the chores. Well, why do you love me? Well, because, I don't know, we're Christians and we're called to love you and you're cute sometimes. Well, why? Well, we're Christians because, I don't know, God said, well, why? 
Jesus, and then they go on their way, right? You give them the Sunday school answer. Point being, kids are very curious, and in the same way, I've not left that curiosity behind. Look at verse 1. He says, show no partiality, and now we ask the question, this motivating purpose, why? Well, he says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory. I think the reason why is because of gospel witness. We are not to be partial as Christians because of our gospel witness. The way you live your life, as the text says, the way you hold your faith, and the attitude in which you do so is a witnessing spectacle. Notice here, though, too, it's it's holding the faith, and I think you could translate this, holding the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Point being is that even your faith is not just something you're holding on to. Right? You're, you're not mustering up this faith. This is, this whole salvation thing, this gospel thing, even your belief is from the Lord. Therefore, how you carry out your Christian life is not just about who? You. And it's not just about me. It's really about the Lord. Your testimony then of whether you're partial or not, favoritism, uh, portraying or not, is about the reputation of the Lord Jesus Christ. If He forgave you, then he transformed you. And if he transformed you, then he did so that you would live in a different way. In our living witness, then, we must seek to glorify God in this matter. Now, for me, this concept became abundantly clear when I first became a Christian. I was on the football team, so I'm lifting weights and, you know, got probably too much testosterone and think I'm a tough guy, fresh out of not being a Christian. So bear with me in this. And, uh, and there was a guy on the football team that did something that some of us didn't like. And I was with some of the upperclassmen football guys who were Christians. And I said, oh, well, let's just go, let's just go rough them up. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, let's go get them. Let's go beat them up. And they kind of looked at each other like, uh, Matt, we don't do that. <laughs> and these were big, tough guys too. But they're like, we don't do that, dude. I was what do you mean we don't do that? And I had to be taught what it means to be a Christian, right? I had to be taught what it means to live. Get this. I had to be taught that that's not how the gospel works. The gospel is not just this transactional thing, and then you just go about your way living your normal life. But it's meant to change us, to make us different. Pastor James's focus then here is transformational change in how we view and evaluate people. Now, we considered, look at verses 2 through 4, we considered this scenario. If a man wearing gold rings and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and also a poor man in shabby clothes comes in, you pay attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet. And then here's the punchline. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Notice his conclusion of this scenario is that this is sin. He doesn't pull back any punches. This is evil. It's sinful. In, in their time, if you've been to Israel, you've been in a synagogue. And synagogues are a square or rectangular room with one bench all the way around the outside. So the best seats were to obviously have a seat, and specifically near the front where you could see whoever was speaking and be seen by everyone. Everyone else would just stand in the middle or they would sit down. And so in this scenario, they're showing favoritism based on someone's financial ability or based on the appearance of wealth and prosperity. Now, what's interesting, this is where I want us to just pull back for a moment and consider, how do I evaluate people? All right, that's the question I want us to ask. How do I, like if we're being honest and just transparent for a moment, how do I judge people? And, and as we're thinking about that, I want you to ask, who, who are the type of people I like to spend time around? Who are the type of people I like to care for, that I like to text in, in on and see how they're doing? That I like to call, that I like to love and hang out with? What are those qualities that you're drawn to? And as we're thinking about that, I want to go a layer deeper and consider, what do you value in yourself? I think that how we view ourselves is reflected in how we view other people. In other words, what we value in other people reflects what we value in ourselves. For example, are you drawn to people that are trendy, that have cool clothes and that have a clean Instagram? Well, what does that, I mean, does that say something about what you think makes you important? Does that say something about your identity? Do we value people's personalities, a bubbly and fun personality? And do you pride yourself in having a certain type of personality? Is that part of your identity and how you're ascribing worth to yourself? 
What about uh, people who are driven? I really like type A people that are just driven. I just want to hang out with them all day. Or maybe you're the other side. I just like people that are chilled out, that are calm, that we can drink tea, not have an agenda. Hold up. Is this part of your identity though? And is this how you're deciding who to love and who not to love in the body of Christ? Maybe you like hanging around people with resources and part of your self-identity is your financial means, your home, your car, your 401k. Long before judgments are made about others, there is an identity crisis within the soul of yourself that is impacting that. It's an output, right? It's an output. Our judgments are an output of our own hearts. And I actually do believe that this is exactly where Pastor James goes. Look at verse 5. Second command of the chapter. He says, listen. Listen or pay attention. My beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Hear, understand, listen, he says. James wants us to wake up and remember who we are, what our true identity is. If you're a Christian here tonight, then that means that your identity is that you are defined by weakness. (laughs) You are defined by your fault. And what I mean is, is that you've come to recognize your sin and laid it at the altar of Jesus. And now you're a saved sinner who's saved not to be perfect, but who's saved because of God's grace. That's who you are. That's our identity, right? Is that we're now sons and daughters of God. We are distinct then from society. And I'll just say, if you're a Christian, you're not going to be cool, (laughs) right? We're not going to be cool ever, ever. Christian cool is not cool, by the way. We're never going to be cool in the world's eyes. If If we could put on spiritual goggles, I think what we would see in this room is that many of us have scars on our face. Many of us have an eye patch. Many of us are walking with a limp in our Christian life right now. Are you with me? Many of us are struggling spiritually. Some are crawling on the ground, even though normally they look normal. Spiritual goggles. They are not doing well spiritually. Some are paraplegics. Some are quadriplegics. Some who are around you all the time don't even have a heartbeat. I think what James wants us to consider is that the gospel teaches us to view people with a spiritual lens. Are you with me there? I think the only way we get beyond our natural bent toward favoritism, our natural bent toward partiality, is to view people with a spiritual lens as people made in the image of God. And when we fail to do this, it reveals not only a lack of love for people, much deeper than that, it actually reveals a lack of understanding or at best, a misappropriation of the gospel, (laughs) of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why James is, in a sense, baffled in verse 6. What? (laughs) But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? James is baffled because gospel transformation should not show partiality. It shouldn't show favoritism. And it was, and guess what? It was being self-destructive. It was actually hurting the Christians who were doing this. It was shooting themselves in their own foot. I think this downward spiral then starts with just a little bit of favoritism, right? You might wonder, well, how do you get there? Well, it starts with just a little bit. And then you begin to compromise a little bit more. Eventually, partiality, which, by the way, is blinding in and of itself, begins to set in and lead you to more severe compromises and judgment. You're drawn then to wealth. You're drawn then to fashion. You're drawn to entertainment. And you're drawn even to the world. To the world. It's always a slow progression, though, right? What's the end in this? Well, it's to your own harm, he says in verse 6. But it's not only to your own harm. Verse 7, who else's harm is this to? Your spiritual decline into favoritism and infatuation with the world also is damaging. Look at verse 7. To the name by which you are called. Believers, what is the name by which we are called? We're called Christians. Many Christs. This favoritism and partiality actually is, is blasphemous to the name of Christ. It causes further blaspheme. Right? It causes uh, dissension and, and really skeptics to hurl insults toward the Lord Jesus. That's why I say this is gospel treason. Right, Our big idea is that God is an impartial God who's decreed an impartial gospel. 
which means therefore we are called to be transformed impartial Christians. But this partiality, this is gospel treason. Thankfully, there's a second paragraph in this chapter. <clears throat> he doesn't leave us with just the bad news. Where are we to go from here? What do we do? How do we change? I want to submit that gospel transformation is the only way out. In fact, for the whole book of James, gospel transformation is the only way we can ever hope to do what he's calling us to do, including killing partiality. Apart from Christ and the inner workings of the Holy Spirit, you will be partial. You will show favoritism. It's in your very sin nature. There are rogue remnants. Here is the best analogy I could think of. When God saved you, it's like a grenade went off in your heart of stone and blew it to bits. And now he inserts a new heart that's alive. It's filled with the Spirit. But there's still the shrapnel from that grenade and that stony heart that exploded. It's not beating anymore. It's not the center, the command center of your life. But there's still shrapnel within your agents, right? And the sanctification process is, is... picking out the painful process of doing your own surgery and pulling out another piece of shrapnel, right? This is what we're talking about here. So I want to submit to you that even though God killed sin and its dominion in your life at your conversion, there are shrapnel pieces of this that we need to get out through this transformation. Not legalistically. We're not talking about moralism. We're talking about Christ-centered, spirit-empowered sanctification. You with me? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you with me? Okay, thank you. Okay, look, hey, look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. He, he begins, If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. First, let's look at what is the royal law. The royal law, well, he answers it in the next clause, which is love. Love is the royal law. And I want to say this, love, that is unconditional, indiscriminate love is the antithesis or it's diametrically opposed to partiality. Where there's partiality and favoritism, there is not true love. Why? Because you're putting yourself and your own preferences, your own judgments on the table as the criteria rather than the way God views people. So, he's calling us to this sort of gospel transformation, and we might ask, how do we do this? And I think I could put it this way. Step number one, and this is in your note, your handout, is that we recognize the sin and repent. The first step to gospel transformation is to recognize the sin and repent. That is, examine yourself and see if there be any partiality within you. In verse 1, he said, don't show partiality. In verse 9, again now, he says, if you show partiality, you are committing sin. And gang, this is where I think, again, another little soapbox for a moment. One of the sad things in nature is when you see something that doesn't grow like it's supposed to, right? Uh, Maybe one of the saddest is when a mother doesn't give proper nutrients to her baby, and that baby is born, and there's uh, malnourishment that's very evident. Another, though, would even just be a silly example, a, a kid that wears shoes that are too small, right? And the feet can often, you know, toes curl, weird things. It's not meant to be hindered like that. Here's the analogy. We hinder our sanctification. We malnourish our sanctification by refusing to acknowledge a sin when it's a sin. Are you with me? We don't call sin, sin. Instead, we say, oh, I probably shouldn't do that. Oh, maybe that wasn't best. But we refuse to use that scary little three-letter word, S-I-N. James holds back no punches. He says, then you are committing sin. The first step then, the first portion of the first step in our sanctification, this gospel transformation, is to recognize the sin. But James is not done. Verse 10, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For, verse 11, He who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. He's trying to drive this further and further. Do you see the point? He's trying to get you to recognize, guys, this isn't just a bad behavior. This isn't just a moral problem. It's not just a tweak, a little adjustment. This is a transgression. In fact, he uses courtroom analogy that you are in the courtroom, anvil down, guilty. Guilty. I think often in the Christian life, we can do the resume comparison. Well, come on. I mean, I haven't committed adultery. I didn't do that drug. 
you know, I haven't gotten drunk, I haven't done this, I haven't done... Whoa, whoa, whoa. What does verse 10 say? You can keep the whole law, but one stumbling point. One moment of pride when you were four years old and you backtalked to your mother. One moment of anger in your marriage. One moment of anger in your discipline of your children. One sin. Oh, God's too holy. You're out. Psalm 5.4, no unclean thing can dwell in his presence. One sin, you're out. That's what James is trying to drive home. I think he's trying to say this. Guys, just get over the, the little false shame here in admitting that there's partiality because guess what? You're all condemned anyways. <laughs> right? We've all sinned. Let's just get that on the table. I've sinned. All in favor, say I. Have you sinned? Yep. Okay. We've all sinned. So let's just be real and honest and examine if there might be some favoritism or partiality that lies within. There's many crimes that fill a prison, right? There's blue-collar crimes, there's white-collar crimes, there's redneck crimes, there's gangster crimes, there's one-time crimes, and there's all-the-time crimes. But they all end up in the same yard. In the same way, guys, there's a lot of different sins, and God doesn't care which ones you haven't done. (laughs) You with me? God doesn't care which ones you haven't done. If you've done one, you're guilty of it all. So I think we need to come to this and honestly say, hey, Lord, there's a pretty good chance that I've committed this sin as well. Guys, this is just honest. There's often times in my life where I'll just say, Lord, have I sinned in this way? And then I'm just going to be quiet for a moment. I'm not expecting a voice. Yes, you have. But I just want to think. I want to think with the Lord. Lord, have I sinned in this way? I would commend that to you as a good spiritual discipline. Ask the Lord, have I sinned by way of favoritism? And if so, Lord, would you forgive me? Would you change me? I repent, which is the second half of this. We must recognize the sin and repent, right? Recognize the sin and repent. Lord, I want to turn from that sin, and I want to turn toward being more like Jesus, who was perfectly impartial, Just go read one of the Gospels. The second aspect, though, or the second way, I think, pathway of this Gospel transformation, yes, we need to recognize the sin and repent. And then number two, we need to live out a transformed life. Look at verse 12. He says, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. And this verse 12 now contains our third command. First is do not be partial. Second is listen up. And now third is speak and act. In other words, live this out. Christian, I've got news. If you are a Christian here tonight, then you are not under the law. You are not under the Old Testament law. The old covenant is gone. It is done away with. Not just for salvation, but even for sanctification. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, Paul says, You foolish Galatians. Why are you trying to be sanctified under that thing which you know couldn't save you? Why are you going back under the law? As Christians, we are set free from the letter of the law. Look at verse 12. And now we're under the law of liberty. (laughs) Liberty, synonym? Freedom. We're under the law of freedom. Natural question then is freedom to do what? Freedom to sin? No. Romans chapter 6 verse 1. A verse that was shared on the night when I was saved. Paul asked the rhetorical question, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have died to sin have also been baptized into Christ's death? Why? That we might be raised to walk in newness of life. You see, the law of liberty is not liberty to sin. It's actually liberty to live as you were meant to live. Prior to coming to Christ, you were in bondage to sin. You were actually enslaved at that point. And it was the power of the Spirit of God that broke the shackles and freed you to be who you're meant to be. I think James is driving at this reality. I think James is driving at we're not under the law but we're under the law of liberty, so act like it. You've got such a more compelling motivation than just legalism. Now you're free to live for God. Galatians 6.2 calls it the law of Christ. (laughs) We're not under the Old Testament law. We're under the law of Christ. Galatians chapter 5. I love this passage. And verse 13, if you want to jot it down. Galatians 5.13 For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but what? But through love, serve one another. 
back in James then, the imperative command in verse 12 is meant to liberate us and free us, but it's then followed by the subsequent consequence for those who don't believe God, who don't follow God's Word, who don't trust God in what He says. Look at verse 13. This is the consequence. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I think what James is saying is essentially what his half-brother said about 15 years prior. Luke chapter 7, verse 47, Jesus is with the sinful woman, and he says, I tell you, her sins, which are many, they're forgiven. Why? For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. This is not an accounting statement. It's not that some people have more sins and others have less. Therefore, if you're really bad and then you're saved, you can love more. It's what you recognize, right? It's, it's your own perception of your sin. He who is forgiven little loves little, but he who knows that they're forgiven much will love much. The Apostle Paul said a similar thing in Ephesians 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Warren Wearsby, the great commentator, said it this way, The way we behave toward people indicates what we really believe about God. Verse 13, he's saying, If you have not received mercy, let me put it this way, if you're not distributing mercy to people, if you don't have compassion upon those who are less than you, then this is demonstrating perhaps that you've not received mercy from God. Implication? You may not be saved. That's what's at stake here. You may not even know the Lord. So again, I close with this statement that we said earlier. I think because God is an impartial God who's decreed an impartial gospel, we're called to be transformed, impartial Christians. I don't think this is just a small matter. I have to admit, when I first came to this passage, uh, my heart was a little bit slow uh, to get excited about it. But as I dug into it and examined my own heart, I'm like, Lord, this is powerful. This is not just a a side note in the book of James with all these other impactful passages. This is deeply important. Ladies, I think God wants to change your life, right? He's in the business of changing lives, even once you're a believer. He wants to free you from deep-rooted biases, judgments, partialities, and favoritism. And let me put it this way. I think He wants to free us He wants to free us to radically love people in an indiscriminate way, right? We hinder our effectiveness. We hinder our relationships. We hinder our ministry fruit when we walk in partiality, when we walk in favoritism. And we experience incredible blessing through relationships when we repent of that sin and walk instead in the Spirit. But we have to let God do His convicting work, right? So, I'd like to take us to a time of prayer before we go into our small groups to ask that God would allow us to examine and perhaps even change.